Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Biters, the hiatus edition, since, uh, you know, Walking Dead's not any, anymore. Since I can never say that word correctly. Hiatus? <laughs> Hi- <laughs> Hi- hiatus. And don't even ask me to spell that shit, because that, <laughs> that is not happening. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I've learned long ago it'll not be, to ask you to spell be, anything. It'll be H I, then a space A T E, then a space A S S. Hi, eight ass. There'll be a silent J in there as well. Yeah, this guy. If all else fails, I throw in a PH. Kirk is the only person I know who could malign the name Smith. Like when he talks about artists, he just manages to take a a, add syllables and the wrong (laughs) emphasis. Like in moaning and then then. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man! And then I always, but always because you you say it and the way you say these people's names, like Stuart Immonen, you you say it usually like Stuart Immonen, and it just comes off like you know what you're talking about. That I'm like, wait, have I been saying it wrong? Is it not Jeff Smith? It's Jeff Smithy. I am. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> uh, anyway, welcome, <laughs> welcome back to uh, Biters, the podcast <laughs> about The Walking Dead and uh, all things zombie. As I said, this is the hiatus edition since, well, clearly Walking Dead's not on uh, for a few more months. So this is the one we said we were going to talk about uh, zombie stuff, co- uh, The Walking Dead comic book, Stephen King's Cell. Uh, Joss Whedon's Cabin in the Woods, and by way of introduction, in case you've forgotten, or this is your first time, I'm one of your hosts, screenwriter and writer Jeff Marsick, and with me is my partner in crime, Kirk Manley, illustrator of Z-Girl and the Four Tigers, and uh, all around... uh... (laughs) (laughs) What is this, a Mad Lib? Just fill in the blank? All around (laughs) adjective. (laughs) Uh, you don't want to give me that leeway man i no i I don't i do not fill it in with a lot of stuff that would be a huge mistake (laughs) talking about opening up the door then never be able to close it again um before we get started i want to give a shout out to our uh, super fan kathy who uh has been jonesing for us to uh to to do a podcast as she says she's been jonesing for our sweet sweet podcast so (laughs) I like Kathy, I like that. <laughs> Kath, you gotta let us know if you get that uh, Godzilla uh, destroys uh, Pittsburgh uh, t-shirt. T-shirt, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, for fans of uh, uh, of Z Girl and the Four Tigers, we just want to let you know that uh, the script is done. Kirk has it and is at work on it, the the script for the fifth issue. For issue five, yeah. The, the end of the first arc that we're doing, uh, it's done and Kirk is at work on it. So, so now it should only be about a year to two years <laughs> <laughs> at my blistering speed. Yeah. <laughs> I got the flash has nothing on me. <laughs> That's right. God damn it. Uh, to that end. So what we're planning is I that, make, uh, I make Adam Hughes look like the flash. That, that's, <laughs> that's how sad it is. Uh, for we'll we'll have issue five ready for the New York Comic Con in October, which is our probably our favorite con. We've been there for geez, yeah, four five years now. It's a, I think this will be our fifth year. Um, but uh, there is a there is a, another con that they're doing a special New York edition that they're doing in uh, June, right? Yes, yeah, it's June. Fi- uh, it's June fourteenth uh, to the fifteenth. Uh, it's at the Javits Center, but it's in the uh, anyone who's familiar with uh, MICC, the New York Comic Con, the um, North. I think it's called the North Hall, is where they put the um, uh, Artist Art. Alley now. Yeah. Right, that's where the whole show is going to be. It's just going to be there. Um, Which so, is a uh, really cool. It's a really cool experience. Uh, if you're claustrophobic, don't even bother showing up. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, Artist Alley. Artist Alley typically for the New York Comic Con, you got the Javits Center, which is what 110,000 square feet or something. Um, and off on this way off in one of the wings, it's really not easy to get to is Artist Alley, and mm-hmm. it is perpetually mobbed from the day they open up until 
you know, the closing time, Artist Alley is jam packed uh, with with well, clearly artists, and uh, it's 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 crazy. So now the special it's so edition- funny too because that that when that the first time they did that, Artist Alley had always been kind of adjunct to Small Press, which is where Z Girl is. Um, and in the main hall, and as the show grew and got larger, they they had to. And there's construction going on for the last three years. Now it's all done, but uh, so there was limitations as to how much they could put into that main hall space. So they they decided what two years ago, I guess, to to split off the um, the artist alley and put it in that north wing. And everyone complained, and everyone thought, including myself, that that was going to be an absolute disaster for those. For the artists, you know. Oh, absolutely. I didn't you're so far away yeah, from exactly. Yeah. I just figured, you know, a big part of the, you know, the, the traffic comes from the rub off from people being other things. And else. completely a huge success. I mean, oh, yeah. everybody loved it. They, anybody, uh, mainly because the people that go to there then are there purely to see the artists. They're not. Yeah. You know, what it did was is it kind of put a filter on the crowd and took out those that were just kind of like taking up space and not really interested in, in, in meeting the artists or buying artwork or whatever. And now it was just really concentrated and it became almost like a separate convention. You go over there and it's almost like it's a separate little mini convention that's yeah. on separate from the show. And uh, I guess everyone's really, really happy with it. So now they've kind of made that a mainstay. But well, it's, it's funny cause we've talked about how the past couple of years we've, we've noticed that even though it says it's New York comic con and it's for all intents and purposes, it's, you know, the granddaddy is the San Diego Comic-Con, but it's, bas- it's basically San Diego Comic-Con East Coast. Um, right. It's that big. But we've talked about how on the main floor there, it's th- there, it's not really about comic books. It's about spectacle. Yeah. I mean, Marvel yeah. and DC have massive footprints. They have massive booths, but there's no comics there. Yeah. Um, all the other publishers, they don't really carry books you know, or comics and stuff. So it's more about the spectacle and about being there, whereas the Artist Alley thing, that is... That is your Comic Con experience, right there. Yeah. That's what you're going there to to find. So, yep. So that's so that's that, what we're going to be doing they, in July. And the reason, and and supposedly this show that they're putting in there, and they're going to put into that area, uh, it's called the special edition, is to try and kind of bring back more of the traditional comic focus, comic central, or centric um, con. And at least that's how they're pitching it. You know, I'm sure if it explodes and becomes huge, they'll expand it and go into the main room and boom, we'll be back to videos and movies. Again. <laughs> but, but, but supposedly, supposedly uh, this is to try and kind of uh, put back into the summer, a, a main comic focused show. So we'll see. We're going to test it out. We're going to try it out. Um, you know, yeah, we, we're going to have a, we'll have a table there. So we'll have a table there. Um, we'll be selling co- uh, Z girl and the four tigers, uh, um, and as well, I'm planning on bringing prints of the Walking Dead tribute art. Uh, I don't know if, if listeners, uh, hopefully some of you listeners have seen that stuff. I did the back half of season four um, where I did an illustration that was um, kind of a poster tribute to th- the episode of that week. And um, and I've gotten a lot, of, a lot of people asking me for prints or copies of those. And um, it's really not kosher to to make prints and sell them of of licensed product like that um but at shows it's kind of accepted as uh, as you know an okay acceptable way to to promote yourself and the shows so um that's what i'll be planning to do but um if you're interested in getting prints of that then uh, you definitely want to seek us out at uh, at the special edition comic book convention at the javits center new york city june 14th through the 15th we should uh, and uh, Kath, I know you're going to be listening. Uh, you can feel free to uh, you know come in and cosplay as your favorite uh, uh, superhero <laughs> or, zombie. <laughs> or zombie or zombie. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, the thing I wanted to bring up was that it's ever since it seems like Kirk has been a trailblazer here because ever since we were doing uh, we uh, I'm using the universal <laughs> we I'm 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 Kirk's pimp slash manager so no but uh, <laughs> uh, ever since Kirk's been doing these tribute pieces now we saw uh, Marvel's Agent of Shield was doing them yeah. and then uh, oh and then uh, but the, the the official show was doing them as well. Well, doing- yeah, the the Skybound site, the Walking Dead. Twitter feed uh, started shortly after I started doing them. They started putting out one right after the the morning after the show as well. Um, 
and I think that you know that it may have been partly in due to that. I mean, may or not, may have been a coincidence. The um, the Marvel ones are much more um, like uh, they 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 took the concept and like really made it official. It's very corporatized, you know. I mean, yeah. they put it on their website, they sell them, they put it out a week before the show, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah, but I'm not the very. F- I mean, obviously, what I do is unique to me, and my st- I kind of developed a style for this that was unique, but and new and different. But this this idea isn't really mine. I can't take credit for it. I you know other artists have done it yes, before as well. Own it, uh, own it, Kirk. Own it, own it. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I you know the one that stands out in my mind that was a couple years back was uh, Francesco Francavelli, who we both like, um, and uh, he did a whole series of episode <clears throat> tribute art to Breaking Bad. That is, yeah. you know, got a lot of got a lot of press and went around. So other people have done it. You know, no one obviously is doing it exactly like I'm doing it, but um, uh, but still, it's uh, it's a cool thing. And uh, uh, and the, the best part is it's been gotten a lot of reaction from uh, people involved in the show. You know, the uh, um, the, the Skybound site retweets all the time my stuff. Uh, uh, Scott Gimple has done shout outs to me, uh, in, you know, about the work. So, you know, that, that, that's been really, uh, rewarding. Oh, what, I, and what nerds we are, like we're sending emails back and forth. Like when Gimple, uh, uh, retweets your stuff or anybody on the cast, uh, you know, retweets yeah. your stuff. Kirk and I are doing the nerd dance. We're like, Whoa, yeah, that's awesome. yeah, it's cool. It's well, cool. your and your Twitter account has gone up a lot too. Yeah, I think when I started, I think I was at like six or seven hundred, and now I'm at uh, uh, eleven forty or eleven thirty, something like that. Wow. So yeah, it jumped up quite a bit, which has been cool, you know. But anyway, um, if people are digging those, then uh, definitely check us out in June and and uh, get yourself some. And then, of course, the plan is for I was gonna I'm planning to try and do one per month between now and the return of the show, and then um, and then continue back with the the weekly uh, the le- the weekly sh- episodes um, once the show's back in October. Okay, moving along. News, dude, uh, another wire actor. I know. Woo! <laughs> Although I want um, McNulty, man. I want McNulty <laughs> bad. I want him in this show bad. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, th- this guy, what, Seth, Seth Gilliam, right? I think is his name. Um, you know, he's not. He's probably one of my least favorite characters in, in The Wire. But I'm in season four right now, so I got a uh, season and a half left to go. He's starting to get better. Um, his, his role on the show, he's kind of, uh, it was a bit of a, he's, he's, he's basically as Carver, he's basically, um, uh, he's basically comic relief, uh, him and him and, um, uh, him and Herc are basically, yeah. you know, they're, they're the comic but it's relief. Seen, at least at season four, I'm about halfway through season four now. And it, it seems like he's starting to kind of see the light. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's kind of starting to understand what these other cops who are real, you know, as they call it in the show, like, you know, real police, yeah. um, you know, or what they've been trying to teach him and what they've been kind of show him. And, and he's starting to get it. And, and he's starting to conduct himself differently on the street and uh, tie himself into the community more so that he has a, a, a finger on the pulse. And, you know, he's, he's kind of distant himself from some of the other boneheads that are, you know, just hack and slash kind of cops, you know? So, uh, but so that that's cool. He's getting a little more depth. I don't know if they'll continue that or not. You, you know, obviously, so keep that to yourself, but, uh, well, one of my favorite scenes on the, in the wire, you've already seen it. was when they already was when they moved down into the dungeon and yeah. they're moving the desk in yeah. and you got one guy on one side and one guy on the other, <laughs> and they're trying to get the desk in and then they get more people to try to move the desk. Right. And they then finally the they're like, forget it. Over there, right? Yeah. And then finally, after a couple minutes, they're just like, oh, forget it, man. It's just not, that thing's not, I think it's Herc who stands there and he goes, yeah, that thing's just not coming in. And Carver looks at him and goes, in, in. <laughs> so they were on both sides of the desk. One side was trying to push one's it in. One side was, one's, yeah. Yeah, hysterical. <laughs> um, the yeah, best, so that was. The coolest evolution, that, that, that show, I mean, we're getting off topic here, but. You know, it, it's a little soap opery, to uh, in my opinion. But um, what's been fantastic about it is the evolution of the characters on that show is really—I mean, they really evolve. You know, I mean, I, I've loved that about about 
Walking Dead as well, you know, and, and how, you know, if you look at, say, uh, um, you know, any of, the, any of the characters, really, um, you know, from where they started. But, uh, well, that's, a, that's like what Daryl. But, yeah. man, but that's I, what makes a good show is, is yeah. you want to see this change in characters. You know, it's like that's why certain shows like like House, right? House is a good show was a good show for like a season or two. And then it's like, he's the same after uh, right. it's not on anymore, but after what, eight seasons, he was still the same crotchety, cranky pill popping, you know, uh, acerbic uh, doctor that he was, you know, eight seasons ago. Well, I want to yeah, see a guy. No, ev- no evolution. You know, it's like someone was a buddy of mine was reading catch 22, the, the novel of Joseph Heller, which, um, I, I think it's a hysterical novel. I love that that book. Wait a minute, wait um, a minute. Catch twenty two is Kurt Vonnegut, isn't it? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're you're more the author than me, so so I'll trust see, you. See, there you go. Now you got me. Like I got to pull my iPad out. I, I, I always thought Kurt Vonnegut did did, did Catch twenty two. Well, not Kurt Vonnegut, but maybe Kurt Vonnegut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just don't have me spell it. Just don't have me spell it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, yes. Whew. All right. I was right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what am I thinking that the Kurt Vonnegut slaughterhouse did? five? Maybe. Um, anyway, but, but what my point is, is that, you know, a book like, uh, like catch 22, it's, it's hysterical up until about, you know, a halfway through, then it's the same stuff over and over yeah. again. You're like, all right, I, I, it was funny the first time and the first couple of times, but Right. Move along, and and same thing with characters. If they're the same retread week after yeah. week after week, yep. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's it's good to see a, a new uh, wire alum. So on, uh, on what do you wire, think? I mean, let's let's, let's theorize about what he's going to be, who he's going to play. I mean, it's kind of obvious to me in my point in my mind. But what do you think? Well, they're saying he's going to be um, who they say he's going to be. Well, Gabriel, it hasn't been right? official, has it? No, no, no the the the. the Supposition, the the prognostication is that he's going to be Gabriel. <laughs> yes, I, I I would agree with that. That would be my guess, and I think he'll be a good one. I think that that's a good choice. Yeah. And, um, based on what I've seen him do in in the wire, but uh, yeah, I still you know I'm still maintaining that he that Gabriel has Beth. That's uh, that's my theory that uh, he's that he took her from. Uh, but I don't know whether maybe he's I don't know what why he took her. I don't know if he was trying to protect her or whether he um I don't know. I don't know why he took her, but uh I'm gonna assume he's a good guy and that uh you know he's the one that was maintaining the uh the morgue. Well that's the thing is that someone brought up a point. You know how we had we had talked about how possibly the, the morgue was a was a, a, a trap. Um yeah. and you know, we had said that before um before Daryl and uh, and Beth go in there, there was the trap, you know, the bear trap in the ground out front, which you know the metaphor, you know, right, the, right. Uh, but maybe someone was saying that it it um, I can't remember who or where, but it was an analysis. Someone was like, no, 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 that that's clearly <clears throat> somebody who cares for you know cares for people. That it, it, it's it's not a trap because first of all, you had a dead body on the table. It's dressed. It's it's taken care of. It's well. It's clean. All the food up in the counter or right. in the cabinets. It's all clean. Everything's pristine. This is a person who, despite society coming apart, this is a person who's taking care of this area. You know, it's their own little piece of uh, right. trying to get it together, keep it exactly, together. Exactly. So, um, so. It was an interesting analysis when I read that, and it leads me to believe that, uh, yeah, you're probably right that, um, because if he takes her away, because if someone would, would take her away, where, who would, where's he going with her? You know? Yeah. Um, so maybe he saw the zombies coming in and figured that the, the house was lost, so he could right. save her. Because, you know, because Daryl did the dumb thing, running down into the basement into a corner. So, <laughs> Yeah, but come on. That was a cool fight scene, man. I know that that, that, that rubbed you the wrong way. And I agree. It was, it was like, too hard, too uh, unbelievable to believe. But at the same time, it was, it was cool. It was cool. I loved how he was, like, using the, the, the stretchers to cordon him off. And then he goes underneath. And it was awesome. I thought it was a great fight scene. Uh, what else we got for news? Oh, I, I posted something on Facebook yesterday that they've uh, they've started shooting uh, season five. Yep, 
and Norman Reedus apparently is sending out tweets every now and then from down there in Georgia. Yeah, I saw the this morning. I saw some from um, oh, let's see, uh, Michael Cud- Cudlitz. Uh, he post he tweeted thunderstorm just passed through. Dot dot dot. Guess my location, y'all. <laughs> nah. And then Josh McDermott did a tweet. Real men get their hair did together. B- hashtag BFFs. Hashtag season five. Cudlitz. Big bald, et cetera, et cetera. Then um, Sonequa, Martin Green. That's um, Tasha, right? Sasha. Sasha? Tasha. Just make <laughs> it up it- as you go along. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other way? <laughs> made it down to, she said, made it down to hashtag Hotlanta. Y'all, let's get to work. Uh, hashtag season five. So they are down there and they're cruising. Dude, I've been I've been in Atlanta in the July, August, September uh, time slot. Yeah, it's uh, it's awful. It's hot, right? Oh my lord! Yeah, yeah. it's like it's like Vietnam. <laughs> that, that would be a hell of a, of a zombie movie. <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, did you see? Vietnam. The, did you see the promos? The Japanese promos that um, Redis and uh, Lincoln did. No. Yeah, there are. You can find them online. They're they're really they're they're pretty funny. Um, they were for I guess the uh, Japanese television uh, audiences. But uh, oh, the funniest thing is I don't know if it's on those or of another one that I saw. But it was I guess it's on Fox. There, <laughs> they have a Japanese Fox. Of course they do. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like they're taking over. Um, that just made me realize something. Uh, if anybody. Uh, fans of the Hunger Games, um, if you ooh, 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 ooh. yes, yes, you. I have my if hand up. if a you uh, <laughs> want a more uh, well, if you want to read something that's even better than the Hunger Games, I just saw in the bookstore today that they've got a brand new edition of Battle Royale out. Um, oh yeah, that's the Japanese version, right? That's the Japanese version, which is which the original, I think. Yeah, which is basically a, it's a, a school load of bus a, a, a bus load of, of school kids. Um, they get on a bus. They think they're going to school. They get gassed. They get knocked out. When they wake up, they're in they're on an island, um, and each of them has a backpack. And in that backpack is a weapon, and or it may not be a weapon. Like you could Kirk could open up his backpack and find a machine gun. I open up my backpack and I find a spoon. Um, <laughs> I win. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, right. <laughs> you with a gun, it would be. That's right. I want your spoon. <laughs> <laughs> the safest person would be the one that Kirk was shooting at. So, uh, and then, <laughs> oh, you just got that? Yeah, a little delayed. <laughs> um, and then it's it's just a fight to the finish. Whoever is left standing is uh, wins. It's a it's a really it's it's a very dark, but it's a very very good book. And uh, you know, it's like I said, it's. Very Hunger Games, but it came out before Hunger Games. So anyway, digression aside, go check it out. Battle Royale in the bookstore. Uh, also, I just saw they've uh, recently posted uh, pictures of the new toys that are coming out. They've got a uh, season uh, or um, they've got a bunch of new figures for both the comic versions and action figures for the TV show. And um, I'm looking at, I guess it's uh, series six on the TV show. And the zombie they have is un freaking believable. It's all the guts are hanging out. It's the one that, and they they have this little drawing. I, I suppose I, I guess I gotta, I'll put a link up on the Facebook page. But it's so funny. It's the, the zombie standing there. He's got his his guts are all hanging out in front of him, like you know, like all sorts of entrails. And then they have this little silhouette drawing of the entrails hung up. And him hanging, and and then there's like an arrow that goes through the loop you can make with the entrails. Okay. So this, the idea is that it can hang, like from the entrails, the way that like the the helicopter scene in the I think it was the so, opening yeah, sh- episode. So hang from like your mantle, like by its. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dude, that should be a Christmas ornament. That is a there it is there it is a Christmas <laughs> ornament from hell. And then they have Herschel, and they have Herschel with his feet and then with one leg in the uh amputated and then a second uh piece you can put on it has with the with the artificial uh limb that they built for him. Nice. 
And uh, then they got uh, Abraham, and they got Carol, who looks like a man. And then they got uh, Rick and the governor. You know, who cares about the governor at this point? Yeah. But, uh, and then on the comic uh, figures, they have a new Rick. Uh, they have a new Andrea. And they've got Dwight, which is pretty cool, with the, the whole iron face and everything. And, uh, and then they have a uh, punk rock with a mohawk zombie, uh, which is kind of weird because I don't, I don't remember seeing that in the comic. But it looks like the zombie from, there was that remake, um, not remake, those Living Dead movies that were not Romero um, that were a little bit weird. They were like B-movies. Mm. They had a, they had a probably looked like one of the zombies from that. But anyway, so those are some cool new toys coming out. Everybody should definitely check those out. Uh, you might want to check those out from our sponsor, Entertainment Earth. Yeah, definitely. I bet they have them all. All right. Any other news? Uh, did I have any other? Oh, yeah, yeah. I had one other thing. Um, I know there are a number of uh, listeners that – uh, of our show that often um, let us know when they've gone to shows or um, have met some of the uh, the Cass. actors at mm-hmm. cast, yeah, at the show and stuff. So for, in the month of May, I found this listing of uh, different you know uh, actors that are going to be from the show. So the Dallas Comic Con, if you're listening to us anywhere in the Texas area, uh, May 16th through the 18th. Uh, has uh, David Morrissey will be there. Uh, I believe he played the governor, right? Michael yeah. Rooker, uh, Emily Kinney, and Denise Crosby, uh, who's new to the show, obviously. Scary freaking Mary. Uh, Motor yeah. City Comic Con, May 16th through the 18th in Detroit, uh, featuring John Bernthal, Scott Wilson, Jane McNeil. I don't know who that is or what she played. Josh Stewart. I don't know what they played either. Uh, Puerto Rico Comic Con, May 24th to the 25th, featuring Michael Rooker. Uh, Wizard World Atlanta on May 30th through June 1st with Norman Reedus. Well, I know it's a, a big draw. John Bernthal, Michael Rooker, and Lauren Cohen. I would go to see Lauren Cohen in a minute. Uh, Spooky, <laughs> <laughs> Spooky Empire's Mayhem, whatever that con that is, May 30th to June 1st in Orlando, Florida with Lori Holden. Uh, and um, I guess next, I'll, hopefully I'll try to go back to the site and see if they have a list for June when we do our next episode. But uh, if you're in any of the areas of, of those cons and you want to check out some of these uh, some of these cast members, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, and send pictures. Yeah, definitely. We don't believe you are actually there unless you can prove it. Prove it! Prove it! <laughs> All right. All right, so we're going to talk about the comic a little bit, right? Yeah. So let's see. So what? Two weeks ago, the uh, All Out War, the twelve part um, spectacle that was well, it was an All Out War between Negan's group and uh, Rick's group. <laughs> the twelve, um, the the twelve part spectacle that probably should have been told in six parts. Easily, holy cow! <laughs> um, uh, so two weeks ago, it ended issue one, which is issue one twenty six of The Walking Dead. Um, and, uh, well, what'd you think of it, Kirk? Um, you know, my, my initial read, uh, I mean, it was, I thought it was a little predictable. Um, I thought that where they, you know, where they went with it, um, it was a little anticlimactic. Um, I'm, uh, there's been a lot of heated debate online and on different podcasts to listen to about, um, and, and again, th- there will be spoilers here. So if you have not read this issue, um, you might want to jump ahead. Um, but you know, lots of people are upset because they didn't kill Negan. Um, and you know, I have to admit my, my f- first reaction is that, that it was kind of, um, a, a mistake as well. Um, it, it, it read to me as, I've, you know, I've created this, uh, if I'm Kirkman, I've created this really cool, uh, really popular villain. Let me keep him around. You know, let me, let me 
create a scenario where I can bring him back the way that like, you know, the Joker comes back in Batman. Right. And, and, and um, that's how it felt to me. Uh, it, it, it just, uh, I didn't, I didn't buy um, Rick's explanation. I mean, I, 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 I buy that he might feel that way given his police background um, and given that the, you know, as we talked about earlier about people's progressing and I think his character is changing because they've now lived in this world a lot longer and they've gone through a lot of things and they've survived and now they have an opportunity to do something new and he's trying to, to adjust to that. So I, I buy all that, but this guy, Negan, you know, it, even in our established world before the zombies this guy <laughs> you know if he had done the things that he did should have been put down you know what i mean and, well it was you know uh, <clears throat> and we talked about this after 126 came out uh for people who aren't savvy to the to the comic um you know like we said the, the spoilers here so move ahead if you don't want to hear it but for people who aren't savvy, basically for 12 issues, uh, for, for longer, actually, I think since about 100, maybe 90. Yeah, he, he came on before the, the war started, yeah. Negan is a nutcase. He's he's an F-bomb dropping sociopath. And uh, right. he's, you know, he killed Glenn in a barbaric, horrible fashion that yep. really, you know, th- th- that raised a lot of fear with, with longtime fans as well. So he's done some, he, he's basically, you know, pull pot with a baseball bat, right. uh, you know, barbed wire bound baseball bat. And he's, he's just a sociopath. And then to go through all this stuff and all the people, and he does come up, he does come up with something, I don't want to say not necessarily cool, but uh, one thing that was interesting was before the climactic battle with Rick's group, he has all of his guys take all their blades and, and arrows and stuff and dip them into the corpses, you know, right. and, and all and then when they go in, so it's basically uh, like biological warfare. So now when you go in and I cut you, I'm not just cutting you, I'm infecting you, right. which is genius. I thought that was a great idea. Um, so, But that just shows the barbarism that this guy is capable of. And, I mean, this guy doesn't go in and want to take over your community. Mm-hmm. He wants a scorched earth policy. He wants mm-hmm. to come in and annihilate you. Right. And to go through all that and then at the end – when basically all of Rick's crew is like, put a bullet in his head. And Rick's like, no, no, we're going to learn to get along or, you know, with, you're going to be locked away for a long, long time, Negan, because you're bad, but we're not going to kill you. We're not well, going to come down to your level. Uh, it's almost that he says, like, I want to show him, you know, how wrong he was. You know, we're going to build this great society now and he's going to see, you know, what a mistake he had made and how he screwed up. And it's like, man, you you don't understand what you're dealing with, you know. Then you know what I mean. Right. I, I'm I'm with you. You know, he's a sociopath. He's never gonna see anything. He's never gonna see the light. You know what I mean. Um, and so I was hoping, and I was hoping that when after Rick gives, and it's 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 those times when Rick just comes across as. Rick's not a leader I would want to follow. Like, and there are there are flashes of brilliance with him, but then there are times like that when you're like, oh, I would, you know, I, I would throw you off a bridge. You know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> and it's no, and it seems like if anything, it's a spit in the eye for what Glenn, how much Glenn meant to you. You know, but that said, I could have let that, I could have let that gone if later on in the issue when Carl comes walking in to Negan's right. bedside, right. right. And he's got a gun and he's yep. just like, and I was like, do it, do it. And then, and you know, and I thought given, given Kirkman's record, I thought that that was a, there was a really good chance. That was what was going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, or, or Michonne would go in and chop his head off or something or, right. you know, and, um, you know, I agree with you. I think, I think it was a missed opportunity there. Um, I would have even liked it better if somehow Negan had escaped and, you know, if he wanted to create a scenario where, you know, Negan could come back, then, I, you know, maybe he escapes and, and they can't get him or whatever. And then, you know, we'd see him a year from now or two years from now. Um, it comes back for vengeance or something. But, the, you know, it's just a matter of time before he's going to talk somebody into get, yep. letting him out or he's going to break free or someone's going to turn on on Rick from the other group and, you know, still be loyal to Negan and we're going to be back in the same boat again, you know? And I thought um, it got, yeah. And, and again, it's it, then, then it's going to be this situation where, you know, Rick's going to pay the price for this decision. 
Andrew is going to get killed or something like that. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't know. I just well, felt you brought like up, well, you brought up an there. interesting comparison. Is this is this the is this going to be the Batman Joker paradigm? Batman yeah. goes out, captures Joker all the time, throws him in Arkham Asylum all the time. Joker escapes, and then he right. captures. You know, is is this the the paradigm that's going to happen here? You know, and something else about the issue that I didn't like was it seemed that uh, Dwight, who was like his right hand man, uh, you know, there was no real. All Dwight said was like, "Okay, I'm in charge now." You know, of of all the people that were following Negan, everybody follow me, and everybody just said, "Okay, sweet." Dude, why didn't you do that like, I don't know, eight issues ago? <laughs> because clearly everybody wasn't swayed by being a part of Negan's camp. And if it just took one person to stand up and go, I, I'm the new leader and everybody was going to follow that easily, why didn't you do that? Yeah. You know? yeah. So I think yeah. it, was, it, it, was, it was a disappointing uh, – this was a disappointing uh, uh, run – that uh you know well I, more I, I, I wouldn't say that the run itself was disappointing i thought it was a little bloated um i did definitely enjoy getting uh getting an issue every two weeks that was spectacular you know i i oh, uh, yeah that was nice yeah i really you know i, I wish that could continue <laughs> but um and um <clears throat> the story you know i thought the story had some highs and some lows and uh you know i thought i thought as an arc it was it was good uh, I, I i don't have that as many problems with it uh as a total arc but that conclusion uh was was a little bit anticlimactic you know i i definitely um disappointed in that a little bit okay um in terms of the 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 book 127 is next and um we were talking about the fact that uh before they started we started recording they've got a uh, people hopefully have seen it we'll put it up on facebook but they've got a comparison of the new cover design that they're going to be uh, going forward with and uh the old cover design and they've changed the logo and the header and everything and boy um i think it's a I, I think it's really washes out the brand, um, you know, dilutes the brand and, and really downplays the whole walking dead. I, I know it features the art more, but it seems, um, it just, uh, doesn't seem anywhere near as strong. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a head scratcher why they did it. Um, and like Kirk said, we'll put it up on the Facebook page, but everything gets diminished. The walking dead, instead of being this nice big font, you know, it's like 25 point font. Now it's, it's, I don't know, probably like 10 point and the image logo is smaller. And, you know, normally when you pick up a comic book, you look off on the top left corner and there's the, the issue number and the price. Well, now even the issue number is really small. It's on top of the, the, the walking dead uh, masthead. And it says it one twenty seven a new beginning. Um, so, but, but it's just, it's just odd. Um, I don't know why. You can hear Kirk furiously tapping over there on his keyboard. I'm sorry, I know that's rude, but I just posted it to uh, the to the to the fighter to the fighter's uh, Facebook page, so that people could see it. Because um, I, I knew I'd forget if I didn't. But yeah, I, I don't. I'm not sure what that's about. You know, it, it just seems like uh, even from a corporate point of view, it dilutes the image brand and it dilutes the Walking Dead brand because it takes the logos and makes them so small. Yeah. So. I don't know. Hopefully they'll they'll reconsider and, and go back. Um, plus, I think the the other thing too is is that by by being on one line, now the logo says the Walking Dead on one line. <clears throat> it all has the same weight of of relevance. Um, and you know, before it says the Walking in small and then huge dead. Right. And that just again just was from a typography point of view is much more impactful and really kind of nails home what this is about you know so I was really disappointed. well if you've been if if you've been hesitant about picking up walking dead you, you've been hearing about it but you're you don't want to jump into the middle of a story and all this other stuff it, this is a new beginning apparently there's a female character on the cover that uh we're all speculating as to who it is and what it right. might be the right. one of the leading theories is that this is the comic that now this storyline is going to be the story that ties into the offshoot of the walking dead, uh, the TV show. Um, we don't know if we, Kirk and I had speculated a, a podcast or two ago that maybe this is uh, a flash forward and maybe this is Judith, uh, you know, what, 20 years down the line, uh, you know, when she's, 
well, actually, no, that can't be because no, that would I I think that, I, got my, that was, I got my I mixed my metaphors. Yeah, you mixed your your TV versus your comic. One of the one of the the ideas that we postulated for the TV show spinoff was that was what you just described. Oh, right. Which I think would be really cool that they end up you know taking Judith, dropping her off somewhere. You know that they feel safe, like a nunnery or something, you know, some some place that's still you know halfway decent and would be much better for for her than being on the road with them. Um, and then you know, twenty years down the road, we 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 meet her and she seeks to go out and see if you know she can find out where she comes from or what her you know what happened to her dad or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> but I I don't know if this is any relation to that or not. Uh, I I think you know there was clearly uh, there have been a couple covers one twenty seven. 128 and 129, I think, which we've all, they, they post them out pretty early in advance, so we've seen them, and none of them had the main characters on it. But I think that was done in order to to keep the suspense in the All Out War arc finale as it was finishing so that we wouldn't know who survived. Right. Everybody was speculating, you know, who might die, and um, so they didn't want to show anybody on the cover because then you would know they didn't die. So they put other things on these, these the Four, I think three or four covers that were published uh, during the the final uh, issues of uh, the All Out War. This being one of them, so it could just be that you know everything is the way we've all it's always been, and that these are just new characters that are going to be introduced or another community that links up with them. I don't know, um, but it is fun to speculate that maybe we're gonna you know the book's going to go in a whole other direction, and we're going to pick up on a different community somewhere else, and then maybe the two books will unite. You know, the two storylines will reunite in the book down the road or something. I don't know. Yeah. Or it's a flash forward, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's got to be – they've got to change the paradigm a little bit because right now it's basically uh, go, into a, go into a location, set up, set up camp, the soap opera that occurs between characters, and then get attacked. And then deal with that and then set up camp, soap opera, get attacked. And we got to break out of that mold and there's got to be yeah. something. Well, new. and the other thing too is that this new, supposedly now, they're going to, you know, they've got these, all these communities that are going to work together. And after all these speeches that Rick has made in the comic that, you know, they're going to try to establish a new start to civilization. Um, that they're going to, you know, refocus on themselves on the fact that the the enemy is is the zombies, and that they are going to unite and build this kingdom, kind of like, and um, start to to reestablish, uh, you know, a traditional civilization. That's not very exciting, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> to your to your point. So um, you could be right. Maybe then. So what they're going to do is, you know jump to some other storyline and then maybe come back to Rick down the road. I don't know. It could be good. Otherwise they're gonna have to turn us into like the yawning dead. And it's just, yeah, be- no, I'm sure it'll be, I'm sure it'll be great. I'm sure it'll be great. Um, <coughs> so 127 comes out next week. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, just want to plug also, I will be on, uh, the, uh, I- the episode that reviews 127, of under the comic covers, which is a podcast, uh, about indie comic books, um, that is a spinoff from the Walking Dead cast of Jason and Karen fame. Um, and I'll be on there reviewing 127 with them, talking about it, talking about Z-Girl um, and comics in general. So you definitely, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Under the Comic Covers, but uh, it's on iTunes and everywhere where good podcasts are. You should check it out. Um, and uh, that'll be the 15th and 16th, I think, of next. So that's next Thursday and Friday because I think the book comes out, 127 comes out next Wednesday. So it'll be uh, that Thursday or Friday, I believe, they publish that episode. So look for me, look for me there. All right. Okay. Good. All right. All right. What's next? Sell or mo- the movie review, right? I don't know which. Let's do, let's do, uh, let's do Sell since we're on the topic okay. of zombies. Okay. So we said that uh, we were going to review Stephen King's book, his novel Cell, uh, which was published in 2006. Um, and is now going to be a movie. Yes, now going to be a movie with uh, John Cusack uh, playing the lead role and uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson, yeah. The- now he's playing, he's playing Tom, right? Yes. Tom from the book? Okay. Now we're not, are we going to try to not do spoilers for this or are we going to. Um, like not tell the ending or we, or do we, do we just go like review the whole thing and talk about the whole thing? I don't know how we want to do this. Um, (laughs) 
probably should have talked about that yeah, before we uh, so we're gonna do this, huh? Question before we start recording. Uh, you know what? It, it's the book's been out for long enough that uh, I, I'd say that let's just talk about the book. Um, and w- maybe we don't talk about how it ends, just so that so that if people want to read it, because basically we're going to be encouraging people to read it. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to be as vague as we can, um, but we won't talk about the ending. Uh, so the, the gist of it is, is that, um, there is just one day there's something, uh, everybody calls the pulse. It's some mysterious signal that happens to go out through cell phones and zaps everybody's brains. Uh, anybody who's on a cell phone, um, through this, this signal and it turns them into a zombie like, uh, the, you know, basically the tur- the first, I'd say, yeah, but I'd say it's like 28 days zombie initial. The yeah. n- it goes through stages, but in- the initial reaction is a 28 days type zombie. So it's so it's an orig- it's it's an interesting concept. It's something that, you've, that we've not seen before because while these people get, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a, a book that uh, is you know technophobic. Uh, yeah, and, that's good. Know, that's a good term. While it it definitely uh, you know. Uh, plays upon those fears of what is actually happening to us when we're on our, you know, cell phones all the time. Um, uh, it, and it turns these people into zombies, but they're not, they're not exactly like your typical zombie genre. And just because how they, how they were in the beginning, there's an evolution, you know, they, they change over time. So, um, and, and the pulse itself, uh, uh, even though you know if if society starts to devolve like the Walking Dead and things like that, um, you know you're losing electricity, you're losing you know uh, all these other things. Uh, there's still a pulse that exists. Like you can still pick up a cell phone and still get hit, but the pulse is it it in itself is mutating. It's it's kind of less um, less effective than it was in the beginning as the the story goes on. Mm. So what that means is that the newer zombies or what do they call them? Phoners is what the core uh, characters call them. Uh, the, the newer products are not as, they're not as zombie like as they're diluted almost. They're not as zombie like right. as the initial ones were. Right. Um, but there were a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting things about the, about the, about these zombies that like uh, the flocking. And it, what's interesting is just to back up, this book was written in 2006 and the things that we've seen in the walking dead. So for instance, these zombies, they would get together or these people would get together and they would flock and they would move like birds. Right. As well, we've seen that in the walking dead, the herds, right. Everybody, right. you know, one hooks up with another, with another. And, <coughs> and I thought that was, uh, I thought that was, that, that was, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, that concept, uh, I don't, um, I don't think anybody really was stealing from anybody, but it seems no. like independently it was developed. Because the others, the, the best usage of that concept in my mind was uh, World War Z. They, taught, they talked about that and these huge, massive herds that were going across the central United oh, States, yeah. you know, and they would be miles long and miles wide. And um, it was, that was wild. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Kirkman did it in. Uh, uh, I don't know, around issue 50 or 50 or 60 because the Abraham had just come in um, and they go on a journey together, Rick and Abraham and uh, Carl, and they encounter for the first time one of these herds, which again, they come over a, a horizon and it's just, uh, you know, miles of zombies. And um, so, yeah, the, in the cell, they, they tend to congregate together and work in, in, and go in masses. It was also interesting too that they um, uh, it was during daytime they went into some remission or nighttime it was nighttime. Night, nighttime they went into this remission where they would congregate into these groups where the signal was the, they, they put up boom boxes and stuff and the signals uh, transmitting and they, they lie down and they just kind of like zone out while, well, I know, again, I don't want to spoil too much, but something is um, being transmitted to them, basically. Well, I like that they were, they reminded me of the Borg, because when they yes. all get together, it's a hive mind. And right. it, when the, the, their core cast of characters, the people, the four <laughs> or five who have not been exposed to the cell. Yeah. What are you laughing at? No, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of a scene. Go ahead, when I'm, oh, okay. I'm, so, I'm, it, I'm, where... 
when they they see these uh, you know they see all these uh, phoners these zombies laying on a football field but right. it's like the signals traveling through every one of them and right. they're all like you know they're they're all uh, uh receivers and transmitters of of this <laughs> signal i love the sequence where they where they find that and then they like they're like well, we can't just sit here and like let that go on. So they go and they get a propane truck, man, and put that propane truck in the middle of the field. When that when they do that, that is one. Of, that's a great sequence. It's a great sequence. So you know, it's it's it's, it's not a Stephen King uh, novel if it's if you can't put you know a little weirdness in it and stuff. And and this book, similar to The Stand, similar to The Gunslinger. And there's probably a couple other ones that I, I'm missing off the top of my head. You know, there's a central dark character who's like the leader, you know, the, the, the main bad guy, so to speak, um, the, the, the boogeyman. Um, they call Harvard, him the raggedy man. Harvard. Yeah. Raggedy this, man, Harvard. Yeah. yeah. So it's this, it's this guy wearing a, uh, a Harvard uh, hoodie um, and they call him the raggedy man. Um, the guy never talks, but when he talks, and that was the other thing too, is that they all, because of this, this pulse that went through them, there's a telepathy. So when right. he, when this guy talks, he's talking through you. And I liked how, uh, you know, they would ask a question, what do you want us to do? And then one person in their group would answer in, you know, like their voice, but they weren't. They weren't in control. It was the raggedy man controlling them. Right. And then, you know, when he gets out of your head and leaves you alone, you're just like, Duh! you know, you feel like you've been violated somehow. You know, someone was, was had taken over your body. Yeah. Um, I thought it was a really cool twist. You know, I think there are probably people who are, um, uh, would be adverse to this kind of a twist in a, in a zombie, uh, you know, story because it's kind of, uh, untraditional treatment of a zombie, but I, I thought it was really cool. I thought it was really original. The idea that they're not just these, um, uh, you know, uh, unthinking, you know, um, automatons that, you know, f- feed on humans or whatever. Instead, it, they were kind of evolving into these new creatures who communicated with each other. And like you said, like a Borg and a hive mind telepathically, and then started to be able to actually exert that telepathy externally, um, because of, you know, the power of their grouping, you know, and their flocking. Yeah. So the, the, the very core, cool. wait, one, there's, there's clay, there's Tom, there's Alice. Alice, Jordan and head, which was the headmaster of the school. So when they start off, there's three of them. There's, there's clay who John Cusack is going to play. There's uh, Tom McCourt who Samuel Jackson is going to play. And then there's this, uh, 15 year old girl, Alice. Right. Um, and so when this goes off, they're in Boston and everything's just going to hell in a handbasket. Stuff's blowing up. People are running at each other, trying to, you know, chew their faces off. One guy, I think, chewed the ear off a dog. I mean, people are just going, they're just going crazy. Right. And uh, Clay is the main character. Clay is down in Boston because he was selling a pitch, uh, you know, a comic book to Dark Horse Comics, which I thought was, <laughs> was, was cool. It is funny. But his family is up in Maine. So when this goes off, they kind of figure out that, holy cow, everybody who was on a cell phone went nuts. So stay away from cell phones. But then he's like, holy cow, my son's got a cell phone. And, you know, he and his wife are a little estranged. So, you know, his whole thing is that he's got to go up to Maine to go see if his son's okay. So that's that's the journey. They... And then Tom and Alice decide to go with them, and that's their 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 journey. It's not so much to find out, hey, why did this happen? Where right. did it come from? The where's and why's we don't care about. This is just an adventure story from, um, you know, from this group's point of view to get to you know their objective and the stuff that they encounter along the way. Personally, so the book's what four hundred something pages long. Uh, it, I thought it was a tough read for probably the first almost 300 pages. Like it, it was, it was kind of an effort to get through. I, I felt there were times when I was like, I could have shaved, you know, 20, 30 pages off of that easy. Um, but right around 270, things start to kind of change a little bit and it, it's, it starts to take off and then I couldn't put it down. Right. So, uh, so like I said, the first half of the book, I was roughly, eh, it's okay. It's typical Stephen King kind of stuff. Um, but then it, it, it got some legs to it and it turned into the ending. While I won't say what it is, I actually liked how the end, how it ends. Yeah, um, I did too. I, I thought that was, it, it, I thought it was great. Um, and I happened to look up something about the, uh, uh, 
I guess in 2009, Stephen King had said that uh, he had gotten a lot of complaints with the ending of the book. And it's actually been, he's changed it for, I think he wrote the screenplay for the movie. For the movie? He's changed it for the movie, which I'm I'm not happy. I like how it ends. That's a a really good ending. And I can understand, you and I can understand why people are like, oh, no, it's, you know, we don't like that ending. Totally understand why, but... It's been changed for the for the movie. So to me, the ending of the book was very much like the ending in um, uh, Nolan's um, the Dream movie, Inception. Inception. Yeah, Uh, that's what I felt like. You know that he's you see the top spinning. You know, did it start to wobble? Did it not? You know, you don't. And everyone and I felt the same thing with the way this was ended. And you know, it was kind of like you could. Write it in your own head, either way, you know. And uh, um, I, I still, yeah, I still say Inception should have ended with the spinning of the of the 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 totem, the spinning of the totem. And when you sit there, and while it's spinning, um, Leo puts his hand down and just stops it. Just puts his hand down and squashes it. And then as if right I don't, there. as if I don't want to know. Like, yeah, I don't want to know. And then just right. take it all the way. You know, um, I yeah. You know, Inception is one of those movies that you you talk about. You know, it, it's it's a lot of fodder for conversation. But I, yeah. I that's how I would have ended it. But anyway, um, so, so yeah, I I, li- I I didn't have the problem with the beginning of the book at all. Um, I as soon as I uh, as soon as just started going crazy, which was within I don't know the first ten or fifteen pages, I think I oh, was yeah. pretty much on board. You know, there was a little bit of a slow section I thought where they crossed when they crossed the bridge. And, um, you know, trying to get to Tom's house. Um, but, uh, but I, I, it, it kept me, it really did. I, 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 I burned right through this when I read it. Um, it had me from, from the beginning. I thought the characters were well developed. Uh, nothing was too cliched. I thought, um, uh, you know, um, you, you started to really feel for this guy Clay's, you felt that it was kind of, a a journey that was never going to end well, but you, you felt for him, you know, um, that, that I started to, you know, that he, he had to get back and see, he just, even if he, even if it was the worst case scenario, it didn't matter. He had to know yeah. that was, that's what it was, you know, and that was the driving force. And, uh, the only problem I had, and it wasn't with the ending, it was with the death of one of the characters. And I'm not. I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I, I was just, just going to say. Yeah, I just, I just did not like how it happened. I didn't like the arbitrariness of it, and um, uh, you know, I, I it, don't, bro- it, it broke my heart. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was very heartbreaking, and especially how you know Stephen King, uh, how he goes on to describe things. It's not just uh, you know X happened to Y, and oh my God, it was horrific. It was X happened to Y, and then. You know, this part was, you know, missing and there were flies buzzing and then there was blood dripping. But, you know, this gets into the gives a couple paragraphs to right. really cement that, hey, this person's dead, you know. Right, right. And uh, um, that was I agree. It was it was totally heartbreaking. And it was one of those where I got past it. I was like, why? What? What's the. And even the repercussion that happens later on. Right. I still don't was- get how that adds to. Well, it, it, it added to the changing dynamic of the relationship between this these guys, this group of people, and Raggedy Man and the evolution of these new, you know, really what, what's kind of happening is, is it's kind of almost like a little bit like um, Matheson's um, I Am Legend, where, you know, in the, at least in the minds of, of the zombies, they're becoming the new norm. Right. And humans are are the bad guys, and um, and that was I think trying to get that message message home. But to me, I agree. I, it 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 wasn't enough to to warrant what happens, and it just uh, that's the only part I had, only trouble I had with the book was that section. So uh, so how many headshots do you give it overall? Oh, I I would say it's. It's at least four and a half. I thought it was great. I think it's a great book. I definitely encourage people to read it. Uh, I think it's a, especially if you read a lot of zombie stuff, um, 
it, it's refreshing to get something that takes it in a whole nother direction, you know, and it really does, um, in my mind, um, do something kind of original with it. So I, I like that. I applaud that. Yeah. And that's what, that's, that's what we need. We've seen so many zombie, uh, you know, so many zombie movies and, and, and books and, and all these things that we, we, there needs to be a new way to, you know, there's only so many ways you can peel the, the, the onion of just mindless people walking around, uh, chewing people, you know, you gotta, right. you know, I don't know, maybe make one of them a female and put her in charge of a special ops team or something, <laughs> you know? with four ancient Chinese warrior spirits. <laughs> um, great idea. <laughs> we should work on that. Yeah. Someone ought to do something like that called Z girl or something like that. Ooh, that's yeah. catchy. Yeah. I like that. But yeah, uh, no, highly recommend it, um, and definitely read it before the movie comes out because uh, undoubtedly the the movie will will pale in comparison, um, especially with that, especially with the changed uh, ending too. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk about uh, Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods. Um, I just watched it this morning. <laughs> Great. That was only your homework assignment like 30 days ago. I know. So. I had 30 days to do that. So I uh, figured the last hour before we start. I, I, I have to say I was I probably put it off because I am not a fan of slasher movies. I don't enjoy going to those kind of horror movies. I was never a Friday the 13th or Jason or Halloween fan. I don't like, you know, I like zombie movies but mainly because of the whole apocalyptic aspect of it and the the you know the group of people that are fighting to survive kind of against the odds type thing and that's i enjoy that but the traditional kind of you know uh, young couples uh, being chased around half naked by slashers just was not my thing but so i was kind of hesitant about this movie the only thing that that was promising about it was of course Joss Whedon's association with it and Drew Goddard's association with it because everything they've done I've I've loved so mm -hmm. and I have to say right from the beginning I was I was sold uh, I I really enjoyed it. there were a couple of gross moments that uh, were of that slasher ilk but uh, they were few and uh, uh, overall it was uh, really well written uh, it was a cool concept I loved how it ended. Um, uh, you know, it had a lot of traditional Whedon stuffed in it, you know, about, you know, the hero becoming the, the, the woman character and she ends up teaming up with the nerd character. And, uh, you know, I like that Chris Helmsworth in it, Thor did not know that, um, lots of people in it that I did not, um, you didn't know he was in it or you didn't know he was Thor. I, <laughs> I did not know he was in it. Um, I, I, did, I thought he was great. I didn't know he was in it. I knew Fran Kranz was in it, who um, was also in Dollhouse. He yes. played the quirky um, techno guy, and he was fantastic in Dollhouse. He was probably the best thing about Dollhouse, if you ask me. And um, uh, I thought he was great. Um, I didn't know, I didn't realize the Bradley Whitford, uh, I guess he was, he's from um, a lot West Wing. A lot of stuff. Wing, West Wing was yeah. a big thing, yeah. But he's great. I love him. And Richard Jenkins, who I think we just lost this year, right? Didn't he just die? I think he just oh, passed. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, he's like, and he's a Academy Award. He was fantastic. Um, and Amy Acker, of course, which is an alumni of uh, love Amy Angel Acker. and uh, Dollhouse as well. So just was pleasantly surprised by the cast. Wasn't aware of all those people in it. And, really cool love the concept that you know and the way that they unraveled the two storylines the way they kind of you know brought them together um uh just uh i thought it was great i thought it was really good what don't, about you don't tell my wife but i think i might be in love with amy acker um <laughs> uh yeah you know i read this i read the script so this movie came out in 2012 i had read the script um before the movie came out and i was like yeah, okay. I you know, cuz it's Joss Whedon and I just kind of pray at the altar of Joss Whedon and I read it and I wasn't all that impressed with it. And I get that it's a, you know, it's basically a satire and uh he's as he had put it, it's a um uh it's a love-hate letter towards the horror industry. Um, mm -hmm. that he feels or that he felt had devolved too much into like torture porn. Right. So 
you know, so reading the script, I was just like, yeah, okay, I kind of get what you're going for, but it's, it, I don't know, it just didn't work for me. Then I started watching it, and you know, you know, the, when it, it's got all the tropes. Um, they don't hide behind the fact that they're using all the tropes and everything that you see, and it's a blend oh no, they're doing that on purpose. Oh yeah, absolutely, because of the whole satire aspect. Um, right. So you know, there's Friday the Thirteenth in there. There's uh, Saw in there. There's uh, uh, what else is in there? A couple other movies that you can bunch you can of zombie, see. the whole zombie motif too. And you know, and then there's the the Truman Show aspect of it. You know, right. Bradley Whitford yep. and, and Jenkins in there. And about thirty. So the first thirty minutes, I'm just like. Okay, you know, we, I know where this is going and stuff. Well, clearly I know where it's going because I read the script. But uh, then when you start watching, you're like, this is a very, very smart movie. Yes. And how, yes, everybody's going to go through and they're going to do the exact same thing, the, the all the predictable stuff that they're going to do in, in these types of movies. But... They're being led by the nose through them. And the fact that there's like a game show going or it, it, it's a game show, but there's a, a bigger, you know, purpose, you know, the, right. the, the, the world saving the world kind of thing. Um, you know, it does, it does get a little ridiculous, you know, like at the end. Uh, but it, it really was, it, it's, you, you finish with it. And like you said, I, I like how it ended. I liked that there wasn't, uh, you know, there was another way that you could have gone with that ending, um, which I, you know, I kind of was expecting to happen, and the fact that they rolled it the way that they did, uh, I, I think was was you know they definitely made the better choice. But uh, yeah, so it was it was an enjoyable, and it, you know, it, it, like you said, it's got it's got the great um, uh, besides Amy Acker, mm, Amy Acker, uh, you know, it's got the great Joss Whedonisms in there, and yeah, and uh, let me get the great Sigourney Weaver uh, cameo. Sigourney Weaver, that's right. That was that was awesome. Totally unexpected. You know, that was cool. But yeah, there's some great lines. Like when they're taking the bets. Yeah. You know, and then afterwards the, the girl comes up and she says, But I had zombies. I voted. I I had zombies. Yeah. No, no, no. There's a different there's zombies and then there's the zombie backwoods torture family. Totally different species. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But and that was the thing too is that is that Bradley Whitford and Richard Jenkins when they're sitting in the control room they're like oh oh this is bad oh this is bad and Jenkins is like what how long do you think I've been doing this job and he like flips right. a lever and there's a gas that gets you know sprayed in somebody's face or there's you know whatever and they are they're manipulators of this you know this right. basically reality show and there's a scene in there that's really funny to me where uh uh. The, the virgin is the last one, you know, right. as, as opposed, you know, that's, that's, that's how, and with the virgin being the last one, she either, she can die or she can not die. We don't really care at this point because that's what the contract with, you know, the, the Supreme being, you know, the contract with the, the game, so to speak, that's how it has to end. And so Bradley Whitford's like, you know, I kind of feel bad for her in, in some way because She's just been really strong and, you know, she's got a lot of heart and she's tequila. There's yeah. tequila. You know, and <laughs> the people start coming in and he just drifts off and, yeah. okay. Yeah, doesn't care really that much. <laughs> so I love that they're having this party and everybody's just whooping it up and everybody's got their little divisions. There's the electronics division. There's right, the demolition right. division. There's And there's uh, all this infighting among them. And nobody gets along with each the other. other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Then, no, uh, that was good. And it's a party, and they're. I patterns. love too how there was this whole um, global aspect of it, and they kept referring to it subtly about their competition with Japan and their, you know, these other parts of the the world that were, you know, comp- and and it wasn't clear what the competition was or how one won and the other didn't, but you know, you were it was obvious that Japan had been so so you know the big competitor and you know blah blah blah. And then of course that all gets fleshed out in in the end and it's very cool, you know, yeah. um the way that that all that all well, is it's explained. Like, it's like it's like it's like this was American Idol, the monster version. Right. And right. everybody else, you know, there was American Idol monster version, Japan and Madrid right. and but nobody else could do it. Everybody else failed, you know, except uh you know The only they, thing that and it granted there was a little bit of a satire going on through the whole thing, obviously, as you said, and um but it was always done in a believable way. It wasn't done in a like wink wink to the audience way, you right. know what I mean? And and so I enjoyed that. But there were two characters that <laughs> 
get actually all three of them right they get pretty hacked up yeah and then they keep coming back and i was like ah, you know i'm having a little trouble with that like get a huge knife in the back or they get the one guy that's hooked on the back and strung up and then you know he's like after that he's fine well there's a zombie swing in a bear trap that like right. you know impaled you know a, a couple of the characters but there's uh yeah there's times when and i guess it's why when i find out that something is going to be a satire i I usually stay away from it just because I don't think I'm smart enough to understand, to, to get all the nuances. And there were times when you just thought that or I just thought that, that Joss Whedon and Goddard were a little too clever. You know, they know they're smarter than me. They, they know the genre a little bit better than me. And they're just kind of, um, you know, they're, they're like using 25 cent words when I'm only down here using, right. you know, understanding the 10 cent ones. Right. So, I, I felt like it, it tried to get a little too smart for itself. That would uh, mean I'm times. I'm down here working with the pennies. The pennies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with the penny words. <laughs> Single and syllable you, the, the, only. The, the sequence in inside the facility when they when the last two characters make it to the into the base or whatever. Yeah. And they set everything free. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That was one of the most wildest sequences I've ever seen, man. And it was great. It was like, it must have been so fun to do, especially to write, because you could just sit there and go, okay, now I want to come up with like every possible nightmarish thing that people have ever done in movies or books or whatever and throw them into this. And you had the guys with the mask and the clown and you had the spiders and you had the... So so everybody who's listening, just imagine, if you've not seen the movie, just imagine a, a, a corridor probably eight feet across, probably eight feet wide, um, a bank of four elevators on one side, a bank of four elevators on the other. Now put probably 20 uh, SWAT armored SWAT guys with machi- automatic weapons and they're all looking in one direction because they're shooting at two of our characters that are in a control booth. They're all looking in one direction. Now, you've got that in your head. All of a sudden, light up all the elevator banks because <laughs> all the elevator doors are about to open and all the SWAT guys stop shooting and they look over at the elevators with an, oh crap, look on their face <laughs> and then the doors open and go all these monstrosities come running out of the <laughs> elevators and once that run once that's done you know the elevator stores close a couple seconds later they go ding they open up again and <laughs> no, more no. horrible things come out i mean it was it was so much so that it was almost a quentin tarantino-esque uh, uh scene afterwards because the floor instead of being this uh you know tile floor is now just it's it's like a sea just, of blood. It's just red, just yeah. red all over. And the funniest thing was, is like all the monsters. They you know they eat everything, and then then they take off chasing people that are trying to run away, and they all go you know they just go hog wild in that space. But then they take off as you know they're monsters. They go running after you know the next kill and everything else. And and the the two people come out of the, <laughs> come out of the control room, and of course, who's left behind? Three zombies, zombies. Yeah. munching, <laughs> <laughs> just hanging out like, dude, man, the party's right here. <laughs> We're just staying right here. <laughs> well, so, uh, anyway, great, great movie. I enjoyed well, it. Well, it got a 92 on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. And, yeah. And wow, then, that's uh, better than Captain America Winter Soldier. What'd that get? I think 89. Um. So a couple of things that were interesting is um, the two things I found out was that the originally the uh, video game Left 4 Dead 2 was supposed to include a downloadable content where the cabin and facility from the movie could be included. Oh, my gosh. That would have been so incredibly cool. Except the parent uh, of the, the original production company, uh, MGM, had filed for bankruptcy um, so as Drew Goddard commented on what the content was supposed to be, he said, the game was going to be amazing. You were going to be able to play in both the upstairs cabin in the woods world and the downstairs facility world with the monsters. Oh my gosh. That and, would have been awesome. I love Left 4 Dead. I haven't played it recently in a long time, but one in the uh, Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2 were just, uh, just the best first person shooter zombie games ever. If, if you ask me. Now, can you imagine this? Cabin in the Woods was announced in 2013 as the first maze for Universal Orlando Resort's annual Halloween Horror Nights event for 2013. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Wow. Dude, 
There were monsters exclusive to that attraction, ranging from a giant alien beast creature, Jack, the clown monster, yeah. uh, a beast, the thing, and, I don't know, this is a vicious man. But, dude, if they use some of the monsters, like, actual, you know, monsters that, like, they had in that movie, that would scare the bejesus out of anybody <laughs> going through there. Are you kidding? I don't do haunted houses. No way. Well, guy your age shouldn't. I know, right? <laughs> It's a heart. It's a heart condition issue. That'll blow out three of your four stents. That's right. Um, so right. yeah, I recommend it definitely. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's probably everybody's good stuff. seen it by now, but for those of you who haven't, um, we were going to talk about we're uh, a little time. long in the tooth for this uh, this uh, podcast, so we were going to talk about uh, let the right one in, uh, but somebody on this team has not seen it. And it's not me. Uh, so uh, we'll save it. <laughs> well, then I don't know who it is if it's not you. <laughs> uh, so we'll actually save that for next time. We were talking about uh, what we're going to do. So our next podcast will probably be beginning of June. Um, Kath, uh, hopefully you can wait that long. Our listener. <laughs> um, we don't know what we're going to do right now about uh, – about We'll talk about a book. We'll talk about another movie. Um, we don't know what we're going to do just yet. We want to try to get something that's kind of fresh and uh, relatively recent. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any suggestions, oh, absolutely. Post them at Facebook and on the Facebook page or email us at uh, biterspodcast at gmail.com, I believe, right? Yes. Biterspodcast yep. at gmail.com. Um, so and, and like I said, we'll do that in the beginning of June, and uh, well, definitely, you know, we'll cover the comic again. You know, we'll uh, wherever that's at, we'll um, uh, go over any of the obvious news. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of news by that point because they will have been filming for a month down there, so uh, we'll have stuff going on there, and um, definitely, you know, the traditional stuff we cover, um, and we'll try to get to um, let the right one in. I'll make sure I watch it before then. Yeah, hopefully. And, I mean, and we may by, by throw some other had, stuff in there. Yeah, by that time you'll have had 60 days to watch it. So hopefully you <laughs> squeeze it in. If I just watch like two minutes a day, <laughs> I'd probably get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, um, all right. Got anything all right. else? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. And, uh, yeah, keep up. Uh, send us your comments and questions and whatever at, at Facebook. Uh, we got some great so you got some great emails from people uh, on yeah. our last episode. We really appreciate that. People from uh, – uh, we've got a couple of fans overseas. Uh, really, uh, really oh, yeah. to our mind, and that's awesome. We, we appreciate all of their, uh, you know, listening to us at wherever. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop. Oh, never mind. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I just had I did this thing pop up that GarageBand was like like suddenly slowed down, and I thought it had stopped. Uh, but it was kept going, so I don't know what's going on. So anyway. anyway, all right, all right. Well, thanks everybody. We'll talk to you in a roughly thirty days. All right, take all care. Right. Peace. If you would like to donate to help pay for this and other Southgate Media Group podcasts, simply go to our website, southgatemediagroup.com, and click on the Donate button. It can be as little as a dollar or, well, as much as you want. (laughs) Help keep this fun going by supporting this and our other shows. Thanks again for listening, everyone. You're the best fans in the world.